Okay, let's take a look at a typical example of a um, calculating a confidence interval for a population proportion, and then look at how we can calculate these things in Excel. Okay, so here's a typical example, right? July 2013, 47% of Australians thought unemployment would increase. Assume that in a recent poll, 146 out of 300 said that they thought unemployment would increase. Now let's estimate the proportion of all Australians today who believe unemployment would increase using a 96% confidence interval. So basically, you know, we went out and asked 300 people, and then we want to see if we can estimate what the true proportion of all Australians would be. So the basic things, right? What are we looking for? We're trying to um, estimate the population proportion, so the parameter from population is just P for proportion. What's the wording of the parameter in this context? Well, we're basically looking for the percentage of all Australians, right, that believe unemployment would increase. What about assumptions, right? If we're going to do confidence intervals, there's certain kind of assumptions we have to worry about. Now, since we collected qualitative data, because remember, all we basically asked them was yes or no. Do you believe it'll go up or, or go down? So when we have qualitative data, we're doing proportions. And there are certain stipulations that we have to abide by in order for these things to be statistically valid. You should recall that in order for us to do a proportion conference interval, uh, the sample has to be a simple random sample. So we'd kind of assume that the survey was somewhat of a simple random sample, which we know they kind of never are, but we can skip that. Uh, the conditions for the binomial distribution are satisfied, which you'll recall means we have to have a fixed number of trials. We had 300 because we asked 300 people. The trials need to be independent. Everybody's answer is independent of everybody else's answer. There are only two options. Well, yes, either they believed it or they didn't, right? Yes or no. And the probability of a success remains constant. And that's kind of that we're uh, assuming that because the entire population is going to have some unknown uh, proportion that believe it or don't believe it, that, that remains constant from each person to each person. Then we also have to worry that the normal distribution could be used to approximate uh, this distribution. So we have to have a large enough sample size, which we do. Um, and then we have to make sure that the expected number of successes is greater than 10. And that's member NP, so that's our expected number of successes, our sample size times the probability of a success. Um, and then the um, number, uh, the expected number of failures is also greater than 10, so that's N times 1 minus P, has to be greater than or equal to 10. Um, and then we also have to make sure that we um, ensure the independence of these um, questions, right? Because the binomial, we have to have independent trials. And if we're taking people out of the population, we know that in the purest sense of probability, each, you know, success, successive, right? The one after us, um, uh, uh, choice, the probability is going to change. I mean, if you think about it in a, in a small sense, if you had, uh, you know, 10 pieces of paper in a hat and three of them were red, the probability that your first choice is red is three out of 10. But now that you've chosen that, that first piece of paper, and let's say it was red, then the probability of the second one being red is only two out of nine, which is really close to three tenths, but it's different, right? It's no longer independent. But if we start with, you know, a million things and 30% are red, we take the first one out and you know now we have one less out of a million. Sure, it's gonna change, but that change is so small that we can retain that independence. So the rule for that is that our sample shot, our sample size should be at least 10% or smaller from our population. Now, some sources um, you know, get even more conservative and they'll say that it has to be 5% or less, but at the very Worst, you don't want your um, sample to be any more than 10% of your population. So we can see that the conditions we have to do here is success is greater than or equal to 10, failure is greater than or equal to 10, and then the way that we write that our sample size in this case has to be less than or equal to 5% of our population is that if we take our sample size and we multiply by 20, that's still going to be less than or equal to the the total, right? That's what being 5%. Now, if it was 10%, right? If you were, if you were going to stick to the, 
kind of the more conservative or the less conservative 10%, you can let your sample be bigger, then this would just be 10N. But in the case of this question, this author feels like we need to keep it under 5%. And those three conditions will never change um, regardless of where you go. It's just this might be 10 if you um, have an author that is, uh, you know, wants to be a little bit more lax. They can let you have a bigger sample. Okay, now we need to check those assumptions. Well, that's really easy. We're just going to take um, our sample size, which remember was 300. And we're going to take that 300 and we're going to multiply by our P, right? And we get 146. Well, that's basically how many we had. Because basically what we're doing is we're taking 146, we're dividing it by 300. That gives us our P hat, right? Because P hat is number of successes divided by sample size. Then we take that 146 divided by 300. We multiply it by 300, our sample size, and we get right back to the number of successes. So you just have to remember that N times P hat is the same thing as number of successes, right? Which, of course, is greater than or equal to 10. Then we do the same thing with number of failures. But 1 minus P hat is just going to be the... You know, 146 over 300, we just do 1 minus that, which basically just gives us the amount of failures when we multiply that by n, right? Because we're going to have 146 over 300, we're going to subtract that from 1, and we're going to get the, the other, the complement, which is 154 over 300. Then we're going to multiply that by 300, and we're just going to get the 154. So just remember that n times p is the expected number of successes. So if you're given the number of successes, that's just what you want, right? And then n times 1 minus p is the suspected number of failures. And if you're given successes, just subtract that from the total. That gives you failures. And again, of course, that's greater than or equal to 10. The last thing is you have to compare this to your sample size. You normally don't know what your sample size is, so you normally assume it to be something. In the case of this question, we could actually, you know, calculate or not calculate we could look up what the approximate population of Australia was in the year 2013, and we could use that for N. But again, this author just decided, you know what, if we don't know what it is, we're just going to use 1 million. So that's why N equals 1 million. And then we know that that is bigger than, in our case, 20 times our sample size, because our sample size was just 300. So 20 times 300 gives us 6,000. So we can see that 6,000 is basically less than 5% of 1 million. That's what's happening there. Okay, Con the conditions are met, so we can do what's called a one proportion Z interval because we're, we're basically using the normal curve to approximate a binomial, which is how we're using the normal curve to do this proportional test. Okay, the symbol and value of the point estimate, remember the point estimate is just that single number that we have that um, best guesses what's happening in the population. And so our best guess is the sample proportion, p hat, and that's going to be our 146 over 300, which reduces to 73 over 150. Of course, if we were going to do this as a, uh, a decimal, we'd see that we have almost 50%. Right. Now, to calculate the interval, we have to use some technology. So let's go to um, Excel and use our technology. Now, here's just our assumptions to remind us, okay, we've satisfied all those. Now, we can create ourselves a nice little easy calculator in Excel so that when we have to do repetitive calculations, i.e. we have these types of questions over and over and over again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just change the um, conditions of that question and Excel will spit out the new confidence interval for us based on those conditions. So let's um, plug in what we have for this particular question, which is, right, we have the 146 out of 300 and we're doing a 96% confidence interval. So the first thing we have to change is our confidence level, which is 0.96. Then our sample size was 300, and the number of successes we had was 146. And like I said, that was pretty close to 50%, as you can see right here. Now, how did all this change? Well, it's pretty easy. This first cell is literally just n over k, right? Number of, uh, sorry, k over n, number of successes over our sample size. So in this cell, it just says equals 
A5 divided by A4. I, it just It's always going to take my number of successes, divide by my sample size, and that's going to give me P. And then Q is always just 1 minus P, so that's literally just 1 minus whatever number is sitting in this cell. And that gives us that. Alpha, remember alpha is our error rate, which is always 1 minus our confidence level. So this one, just like the cell above it, is simply going to be 1 minus a different cell. But in this case, it's 1 minus this one, right? Because we've taken the opposite of our confidence level. Now, our Z critical level, the, the thing that we have to use to plug into this formula, right down here, the margin of error is going to be some sort of Z critical value times, basically, this is kind of like a, a standard deviation of our distribution. Well, the Z critical value always changes depending on what our alpha is, right? They always call it Z of alpha over 2. Because you'll recall, we've got the, the nice little normal curve. We have the confidence interval sitting in the middle of it. And then in each tail is half of our error rate, half of our alpha. So if our alpha is 4%, we're going to have 2% in each tail. Now, in order to get a Z of 2%, right, i.e., what's the critical, the Z critical value that has only 2% in the tail above it in Excel and also in a lot of technology to find that value, you have to tell the piece of technology the uh, a proportion of area that's below it, to the left of it. So if we have 2% in the tail above it, we have 1 minus that, or 98% below it. And that's where this calculation comes from, is finding that area below it, which, as I've written here, is simply just our confidence level, 96, plus our alpha divided by 2, so plus half of this. So in my calculations, I just took this square and I added this square divided by 2, right? So I have A3 plus A8 divided by 2. And that's going to give me that 98% that I can then use to solve backwards for my z-score, and that uses the norm.inverse function. So the equals norm.inverse function asks for three things. It says, give me the percentage of the distribution that is left of this critical value that you're trying to find, comma, Give me the mean, comma, give me the standard deviation. So in the case of this, I told it, take A9, because that's going to be the area that's to the left of my value. And then I put comma 0, comma 1, because we're, we're doing Zs. So we're living on the standard normal Z. And the, the mean of the standard normal is always 0, right? The standard deviation is always 1. So that's how I end up getting my Z-score. Now, all I have to do is calculate my standard of error. My, sorry, my standard of error, my margin of error, or what's sometimes called standard error, and that's using this formula. So we're basically just going to write this formula in Excel, but use references to, to other cell values rather than typing in you know, what the Z alpha is, what the P hat is, Q hat, and so on and so forth. So it just equals my Z of alpha over 2, which is the value in A10, and then time, so I've got to put the asterisk in there. Then I'm taking the square root, so that's SQRT, right? That's the, the shorthand to tell Excel to take a square root of something. And then you put inside the parentheses all the stuff that you're taking the square root of. So I need P hat times Q hat. Well, P hat is just the value that's in A6, and then asterisk, the value that's in A7, and then forward slash for division, the sample size, A4. Close the parentheses, hit enter, and there is my margin of error. Almost 6%. So it's going to go plus or minus 6%. Now, to find the lower confidence interval and the upper confidence interval, basically the, the lower value, uh, the lower bound and the upper bound of our confidence interval, we simply just take our p hat and plus and minus our margin of error. So this cell is going to be this one minus this one, and then this cell is going to be this one plus this one. So you can see that there is A6 minus A11, and then the next one is A6 plus A11, and that is going to be our margin of error. Now we want to make sure that we round it to the uh, appropriate number of decimals, so we can use these things up here to either show more decimal places or show less. In the um, instance of this question, 
they ask us to round to three decimal places. So we can go back here and we can go, all right, we want one less. And then, yes, we could round this by hand, but this is a really um, bad thing to do. To, to show four and then round a three, you don't know how this nine was rounded. It could have been you know, rounded up and then you're rounding up twice and maybe you wouldn't have rounded normally. Now, obviously with a nine, it's not a problem, but if it was a five, it could have actually been a four before. Just the bottom line is you always want to let the technology do all the rounding for you. That's the safest way to make sure you don't mess it up. So there's my two answers, 427, 546. If we go back here, there's 427, there's 546. Now, the conclusion, well, we're 96% confident because that was the level of confidence that we got that the percentage of all Australians that believe unemployment would increase is between these two numbers, 42.7%, right? We just converted that to a percentage and 54.6%. So that's how we basically go through the entire process and how we use a nice little Excel um, function, so to speak, to, to do these for us. Because now we can come along and the next question would be, okay, give us a 95% confidence interval. And here they could change it up. Instead of telling you what your sample size was, or they would tell you what the sample size, they say, okay, you went out and you took a sample size of, let's say, 500. And in that sample, 33% uh, of your sample thought whatever, right? So that was your success rate. Well, how do you figure out the number of successes? Well, that's really easy. Your number of successes, remember, is n times p. So you just do equals, oops, sorry, 500 times that 0.33%. And then make it big enough so you can see what it is. So that tells me 165. So then I would come here and I would do, oh, all right, so that means I had 165 successes. You'll see that my P is 33 like it said it was, and then everything changed, right? Here is my new Z to only be 95% confident. It's basically 1.96. Here's my new margin of error of only 4%. And here's my new confidence interval of basically 28.9 to 37.1. So that's the, the nice part about using Excel is we can do multiple questions uh, much quicker because we all we have to do is change the stuff in yellow and then everything else changes for us. Okay, hope that helps.